Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Batcast. Today is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. I'm Rifat Manan, and I'm remotely joined by my good friend, Amelia Madrigal, who is in Boston now. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Boyana Yurjevic, who is an associate professor of pathology at University of Toronto. And she is also the gynecologic pathology lead at the Sunnybrook Health Science Center in Canada. Today, she is going to deliver the 10th lecture in our GYN pathology lecture series. And the title of her talk today is going to be Interpretive Approach to Mucinous Lesions Involving the Ovary and Other Diagnostic Challenges. As always, please post your questions and comments on Facebook and YouTube chat windows and we will pass them on to Dr. Georgievis at the end of the session. And thank you, Dr. Georgievis, for joining us today. Over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, very much for the invitation and for the opportunity uh, to present. And uh, thank you for, uh, to all the attendees um, for being here today. I hope everybody is, is doing well in these challenging times. So uh, today uh, we are going to talk about frozen section uh, and particularly focusing on the ovary uh, and also uh, with an additional focus on mucinous lesions involving the ovary as this is, seems to be uh, one of these recurring uh, diagnostic uh, challenges for us uh, in gynecologic pathology. So we'll start by just a general discussion, a general approach, what to know and what to do before frozen section interpretation. It's always go important to go in prepared if, if that's possible. Um, what distinctions are important and impactful to patient management? Um, and I'll, I'll show you the algorithm that, that I use that I've found most uh, practical. So sort of the mental al algorithm I go through in my head when I approach an, an ovarian frozen section. Uh, we'll talk about what to actually write down as your frozen section diagnosis. Remember your frozen section diagnosis is not like your permanent diagnosis uh, in all cases. And uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of uh, case examples uh, to illustrate uh, some of these points. So before frozen section interpretation, um, of course, uh, patient age is, is always important, uh, particularly if you, have, if you have a young patient, uh, because then, for example, your consideration between uh, an epithelial malignancy versus a uh, germ cell tumor uh, uh, may be uh, relevant. Uh, always, for the same reason, it's important to know um, some of the tumor markers if they are available uh, for uh, germ cell tumors, uh, things like HCG, AFP, LDH, um, for uh, epithelial malignancies, uh, although there are some pitfalls that I will discuss later, CA125, uh, CA and CA19. And if this is available to you, there's also the um, RMI score, which is basically uh, stands for risk of malignancy index score if, if your clinicians use it. And it's essentially a um, combination of um, considerations of ultrasound findings of the mass, uh, patients pre versus postmenopausal status, and CA125 level. Um, so generally, an RMI score over 200 indicates a high risk of malignancy. Okay. Uh, other relevant history, of course, is tumor laterality. Uh, so if, if we know going in that the patient has bilateral ovarian masses, um, we're going to think for primary ovarian tumors about serous carcinomas, um, and uh, borderline tumors, uh, most, most commonly. And of course, uh, we're always going to consider the possibility of, of metastasis. But, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, uh, just remember that uh, preoperatively masses that are unilateral may become bilateral eventually. So don't let yourself be um, 
overly biased by the information of unilaterality. Um, unilateral may convert to bilateral. Of course, we want to know if there's any previous pathology, history of previous therapy, uh, and uh, if there are any intraoperative findings. Um, the surgeon should communicate this to you, but uh, I've been in situations where uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, there's widespread peritoneal disease and nobody said anything. So if you suspect uh, something like that, do not be shy to ask. Um, in terms of gross assessment, of course, tumor size, what's going on on the tumor surface? Are there tumor excrescences? Are there uh, surface adhesions? And this is also going to be very important to document um, as you um, go forward and actually start cutting into the mass so that the person coming in to gross the specimen for permanent section uh, can uh, describe it. Um, of course, we want to know the tumor integrity. Is the mass received intact or, or ruptured or disrupted in some way? And very important for ovarian uh, tumors is to sample generously at frozen section. Um, we have the benefit of our um, uh, pathology assistants actually sampling for us and my my sort of standing uh, request is is let's start with three sections of ovarian uh, of the ovarian mass uh, right straight out of the gates uh, and uh, this is this is very very important because you are going to uh, sometimes have a bad first section, uh, something didn't freeze properly, or you will have uh, tumor intertumoral heterogeneity, which will be very important to your interpretation. So it's very important to just go with multiple sections straight out of the gates so that you're not losing time. Okay, um, so wh what what is important? What is really, really important to to um, uh, distinguish that will have impact on patient management when you're dealing with the frozen section. So uh, typically when, when, uh, when a patient has an ovarian uh, carcinoma, they will, uh, particularly high grade uh, ovarian cancer, they will receive uh, TAHBSO including lymph nodes. That's the default operation. And then the frozen section guides modifications from this standard approach. So so how so? Let's talk about that. Um, so if the consideration is primary versus metastasis, so if, if you do a frozen section and you say, oh, you know what, this is a, actually a, a tumor metastatic to the ovary, the surgery may stop. Um, and at that point, let's say we're dealing with a likely colorectal metastasis, we have the opportunity to, to identify the primary source intraoperatively. So frozen section is important. Um, if we are trying to distinguish, for example, a mucinous borderline tumor versus carcinoma, which it may not always be possible, uh, but at least you, you know you should say, well, I obviously can't rule out the possibility of carcinoma. Uh, the the surgeon should be examining the um, appendix and the pancreatobiliary tree. Um, there are some new studies that now say that if the appendix is normal, uh, the chances of a metastasis are, are much lower. So some, some surgeons are following this, but I still, we still communicate this with, the, with, the, with our gyneonks. How about carcinoma versus lymphoma? This is another very important distinction because you want to be able to save some fresh tissue for a lymphoma protocol. So even if you have a slightest inkling that you might be dealing with a lymphoma, um, it, is, uh, it is important um, to mention that. If you are dealing with a young patient um, and you identify a, a likely germ cell tumor, um, the patient uh, will most likely get a unilateral, unilateral South Pinkofrectomy and will not receive a lymph node dissection. Uh, what about cystadenoma versus a borderline tumor? So uh, it, for our, our surgeons do not perform um, uh, lymph nodes, uh, lymph node dissections for borderline tumors. And uh, uh, but but if you are if your distinction is between cyst adenoma versus borderline tumor, cyst adenoma will not receive staging, whereas a borderline tumor 
uh, will, like peritoneal biopsies. Um, what about the distinction between a low-grade carcinoma? So this is once you've you've zeroed in on the fact that the tumor is most likely a primary. Um, in low-grade carcinomas, especially grade one endometrioid or low-grade mucinous carcinomas, uh, the uh, lymph node dissection may be omitted. And with high-grade serous carcinomas, actually, interestingly, uh, if there is consideration of intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy, uh, uh, they may omit um, lymph node dissection in or and, and instead place an intra uh, peritoneal catheter. Okay, so let's talk about the algorithm. Uh, so this is this is just this is essentially the algorithm that over the years I have I become come to follow and I find most useful. Um, the first distinction is for me to try to det determine whether epithelial or whether we we're dealing with an epithelial or a non-epithelial proliferation. Um, if we are, uh, my computer is freezing a little bit here. Okay, so here we are. So if um, we are dealing with a uh, epithelial lesion, then the next um, point of consideration is non-mucinous versus mucinous tumor, if, if that's possible. If I'm in the non-mucinous category, then I will consider the typical um, non-mucinous primary entities. Metastases that are non-mucinous to the ovary are, are very, very rare. If I am dealing with something that's mucinous, however, um, this is where it's very important to rule out the possibility of a meta tumor metastatic um, to the ovary. And we will dedicate uh, several case examples to this today. Um, so uh, if I am considering the possibility of, if I have a mucinous tumor involving the ovary, there are three key things that I want to examine whether there is diffuse uh, high-grade cytology, is there diffuse infiltration of the ovarian stroma by the tumor, is there infiltrating mucin? If not, uh, chances are I am dealing with a, a primary tumor. Um, of course, going back to this um, high-grade versus low-grade uh, issue, um, sometimes if you've determined that you're dealing with a, a primary ovarian tumor, that distinction, your surgeon may ask you for that distinction, whether you have a, a high-grade or a low-grade. On the other side, if we have a non-epithelial a non um, proliferation, then Again, here, it is very important to recognize uh, things like germ cell tumors and, and lymphomas, or at least raise the possibility that they, that's what you might be dealing with. Okay, um, my computer has frozen. Can anybody hear me? Hello? Hello? Okay. Okay. So I I am I am not getting any response from anybody, so I am going to try to log back into this session if I can. Uh, and pick up where where we are. I I no I can't hear anybody right now. So I'm uh, going to. Hi, I'm can here, you hear me? Liana. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Can I'm you here. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's just that I am not able to progress through my slides for for whatever reason. Uh, so we're we seem to be experiencing a technical difficulty. Uh, um, maybe like I mean I, it, it we can be online so you can just uh, I think log in and log out or. How are you going to do that? Uh, yeah, let me just try to do that. I am, uh, let me see. Ah, okay. Okay, That's we seem okay. to yeah, be- it's working, I guess. Okay, it yeah, seems yeah. to be, it, we seem to be, I think I I think I found the problem here. So, okay, okay. I will continue. Sorry about that. Okay. It's uh, just no that my, my pointer may not. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, okay, we'll make it. Fine. We'll make it happen here. Okay. So, uh, how does grading work on frozen section? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, if if we're dealing with a high grade, if we're dealing with a serous cancer, uh, then of course we have the two 
two-tier grading system. And sometimes this may be really difficult to, uh, to ascertain on frozen section. I'll show you some examples. Uh, but generally, we're looking for a great deal of discrepancy in nuclear size from one nucleus to another for high grade and uh, 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 numerous mitoses. Again, they may be less obvious on frozen section, but essentially a uh, a great deal of anisocytosis is what we're looking for to establish the, the uh, diagnosis of high grade. Um, if we are dealing with uh, clear cell, those are automatically high grade as well as for carcinosarcoma. And uh, then if we have an endometrioid neoplasm, we apply the modified FIGO um, grading. So um, now for mucinous tumors, um, if the vast majority of mucinous uh, tumors should be low grade. So uh, glandular architecture, low to mild cytologic atypia and no brisk mitotic activity. If you have diffuse high grade cytology or a solid component, and we will talk about this in, in detail uh, a little bit later, uh, you know, you really need to exclude the possibility of metastasis. And I would uh, strongly suggest you take more sections if, if you're just seeing this in one section. Okay, uh, now, so you will say, well, Boyana, this is all well and good, but what do I actually write in the heat of the moment? Um, so I will, I will um, invite you to just take a quick step back and consider that, you know, the frozen section uh, consultation is, is sort of a, is a triaging tool. Right, it's you are not necessarily asked to provide the be all and end end all diagnosis, and sometimes it is just not possible to progress very far down that algorithm that I've shared with you. So sometimes you really can't say more than malignant neoplasm, but sometimes, or actually a lot of the time, that's really all they really want to know. Um, sometimes it's it's difficult to actually commit um, to a lineage. Um, so for example, uh, you can say, you know, carcinoma, uh, and that's all you can, as far as you can go, or you can say poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm cannot exclude lymphoma, because remember, that's, that's something that you don't want to miss if it's there. Um, we have situations where we really can't commit if a mucinous neoplasm is uh, is uh, primary or a metastasis, and it's important to communicate that, uh, and at the same time leave the door open for the permanent section to to resolve the issue. So you can say mucinous neoplasm cannot exclude metastasis. Um, now, uh, sometimes you can you are sure of the lineage. Um, but you just don't know how far you can go. And the most, in, the most common example of this is actually dealing with, with borderline tumors. So you can say at least mucinous borderline tumor uh, and you know, cannot exclude carcinoma, for example. So that, that at least um, is, is important so that they know, uh, that most of them should know anyways, that uh, this may convert to a carcinoma down the road. Okay, and um, lastly, uh, if the histology type is uncertain, uh, but they just need to know if it's high grade or low grade, so you can just say high grade ovarian carcinoma. Okay, all right, so let's let's uh, make this a little bit more fun. Uh, let's start looking at some cases. So we have a 58 year old lady uh, with a 16 centimeter mass and uh, CA125 is elevated, but it is not very, very high. And the mass is unilateral. So this is what we have. Uh, and, you know, uh, definitely what we see here is something that looks epithelial. So we can commit to that. Um, and it seems to be composed of papillae with some epithelial proliferation happening. So there's some tufting and some branching going on. Um, so, so as we get further into this, um, the cytologic atypia here does not look terribly concerning to me. Sorry, I've lost my pointer. 
So we're going to go to the algorithm. Uh, so where where would we end up here in the algorithm? Well, we can say this is epithelial. We can say this is not mucinous. So I am I am somewhere in the primary area, and I'm not, not actually sure if I am dealing with a borderline or a low grade serous or a high grade serous. Not quite sure where I am. So some possibilities, what we could say, malignant neoplasm. I think we can do a little bit better than that. Um, carcinoma, not so sure um, if it's carcinoma or borderline based on what I'm seeing. Uh, serous carcinoma, high grade serous carcinoma or low grade serous carcinoma. But here is the power of doing multiple frozen sections. So here's another uh, section of that same tumor. And now we're really starting to see um, a much greater architectural complexity. We're starting to see uh, stromal invasion, uh, fusing glands. So now I'm, I'm really kind of out of the borderline territory and I'm, I'm thinking about carcinoma. And actually now in this section, although not, not as terrible as it could be sometimes, but I'm actually seeing quite a bit of cytologic atypia and mitotic activity. So you can see now with just that additional frozen section, I can, I can move more confidently through this algorithm. So Frozen section diagnosis was high-grade serous carcinoma in this case, but remember that that first section that we started with, that this actually had focal areas of borderline architecture resembling a serous borderline tumor. And when we took more sections and we went on high power, um, we could actually see those high-grade nuclei. So this was a high-grade serous carcinoma. All right, let's go to another case, case two. We have an 88 year old lady with a uh, 15 centimeter mass. Uh, it's a unilateral mass and it was received in fragments. CA125 was 176 and uh, CA199 and CEA were within uh, normal range. Okay, so here we have another tumor. And you know, Sometimes the frozen sessions are great and this is not one of them. I have no idea what to do with this. This is not helpful. Where can I go with this? Very, very stuck right now. Okay, what can we say? Malignant neoplasm, can we go that far? Carcinoma, sarcoma, serous carcinoma, carcinosarcoma. But here is another section and this one actually turned out pretty decently. So now I think we can commit to a malignant neoplasm. And there is, there is a spindle, a malignant spindle cell component, but there's also, as you can see here, if we sort of zoom out of the picture, you kind of get a, an idea that maybe this is, this is actually a biphasic neoplasm of some kind. So this on the permanent section was the fallopian tube. And this was a carcinosarcoma with a high grade serous carcinomatous component. And the primary was in the fallopian tube. So you could see how in this case, again, it was very important to get additional frozen sections. And uh, we weren't sure what we were dealing with. We couldn't even say for sure if this was epithelial or non-epithelial, but really what they wanted to know is that this was a malignant tumor. All right, so now let's go into the mucinous tumors involving the ovary. Okay, so why, why is this a, a, a recurring problem for us on frozen section? Well, the, the, the trouble with these mucinous neoplasms involving the ovary is that the tumors metastatic to the ovary may mimic the full range of morphologies of primary ovarian mucinous lesions. So even though um, mucinous carcinoma represents only 5% of mucinous lesions of the ovary, um, 
mucinous carcinoma, when it's in the ovary, is much more likely to actually be a metastasis than a primary mucinous carcinoma. So this is why we have to be careful. Okay, and so what are some of the possible uh, origins of these metastases? Uh, lower GI tract, um, appendix, upper GI tract, pancreas, hepatobiliary tree, uh, endocervix, yes, we've seen it, um, and also breast and lung. Okay, so um, what are some of the gross features that we want to uh, take note of? A smooth surface, people will say, well, generally if things have a smooth surface, that might favor a primary. Multinodular uh, proliferations, on the other hand, would favor a metastasis. Uh, surface hemorrhage or adhesions, again, is something that favors a metastasis. Now, um, quite a number of years ago, there were a few papers that suggested that, uh, you know, if you're dealing with a um, small tumor, so whether you want to put your cutoff at less than 10 centimeters or, or less than 13 centimeters, um, and a unilateral, uh, uh, sorry, a small tumor, uh, that, that this uh, favors a metastasis, particularly if things are bilateral. But I think that where, where we get concerned is the converse of this is not necessarily true. In other words, we can have unilateral tumors that are large and they can turn out to be metastatic. So we recently uh, published a study where we looked at a series of mucinous tumors involving the ovary, both primary and metastatic tumors. And what we actually found was that um, metastasis um, can be large. So in fact, 67% of uh, metastatic tumors in our study were uh, greater than 15 centimeters in size, and 38 were greater than 20 centimeters in size. Um, and that unilaterality again, is not, is not a given. Also, the impression of unilaterality preoperatively may change subsequently. So, you know, on imaging, the patient may have one really large ovary, uh, and that's all you might see. But in permanent sections, the other ovary may turn out to be metastatic, uh, have metastatic tumor uh, in it as well. So the bottom line here is do not be biased by unilaterality and large tumor size. Okay. All right. So what are some of the findings typically associated with primary mucinous ovarian tumors? Okay. Well, for sure, if you have a background of borderline tumor, um, this, this is very, very helpful. Um, things like mural nodules are, again, another uh, helpful uh, clue to the primary. Presence of Brenner tumors, teratomas, even carcinosarcoma and leiomyoma, which is rare. Uh, these, these are all very helpful features. Usually, it is very rare, though, to see all of these things, except for the background of borderline tumor on uh, frozen section. All right. So, what we found in our study is that there were three key histological features that were really helpful towards making the diagnosis of uh, metastasis. So if there was a diffusely high-grade cytology, diffusely infiltrative pattern of invasion, and stromal infiltrating mucin. So this is, this is what we mean by low-grade versus high-grade cytology. Sorry, I've lost, lost my pointer here. Uh, but uh, the low-grade you can see on, on, the, uh, on the left, uh, and the high-grade you see on the right. So that sort of the difference between the two. Uh, the, I would say the low grade really this the cells res, resemble uh, like low grade um, uh, mucinous epithelium. Okay, here's low grade. The other one, the other important feature is infiltrating stromal mucin, and you have to you have to watch carefully for it on frozen section. But it it is definitely uh, something where you will see pools of mucin splaying uh, the stromal tissue apart. So you're kind of looking for for just great areas of cellular paucity, and then. 
pattern of stromal invasion. So diffusely infiltrative uh, patterns. So either in the form of large expansile glands, anastomosing glands, or small glands, but again, kind of haphazardly oriented glands. Uh, you know, if you look at the middle panel here, this, this is not what borderline tumors look like, right? Uh, and then, of course, the most obvious example is, is if you see infiltrating signet ring cells uh, or, or clusters of, of signet ring cells. That's, that's, a, uh, that's an easy one. Okay. So here is a case that we have, a 71-year-old woman uh, who four years ago had a T4 carcinoma of the right colon, now presents with a right ovarian mass. Uh, she has a 10 centimeter right ovarian mass, unilateral, um, and it's tan in color and has hemorrhagic areas. So this is what we have. And so I think I don't have to spend a lot of time um, demonstrating that this is this is a cytologically high grade compared to that low grade picture that I've seen dif that I'm shown diffusely infiltrative right so it does meet the criteria for um, and of course it looks so much like a colorectal uh, carcinoma with with comedonecrosis so this is this is not a difficult case this is not a difficult diagnosis um, so we know where we would be on the algorithm here very very straightforward um, so uh, this was a metastatic colon carcinoma to the ovary uh, but it was a unilateral mass um, it was less than 13 centimeters in size uh, and the m morphology was strongly uh, uh, suggestive of metastasis. Okay, so that was easy. Case four, presenting history, a 33 year old woman, recent history of miscarriage, enlarging bilateral anexal masses for past five months and virilization. And this, this was uh, somebody that had 15 centimeter uh, ovarian masses bilaterally. They were white and solid and multilobular, smooth external surface. And this is what they looked like. And again, um, I think we can agree that this is malignant. This is epithelial. And um, this is diffusely infiltrative. Uh, and unfortunately, this, this ended up being um, a signet ring carcinoma metastatic to the ovary. So um, this was the classical Krukenberg tumor. So bilateral masses, um, although smooth outer surface, but and they were large, uh, but a very, very convincing uh, histological pattern for metastasis. Uh, it's interesting here uh, in this particular case, virilization following a recent pregnancy is actually a clue um, this was a this ended up being a gastric carcinoma uh, and somehow these metastatic gastric tumors uh, are 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 supposed to stimulate um, ovarian androgen production so this is this actually has been described so she she ended up having an antral mass a signet ring carcinoma okay um, case five. A 52-year-old patient with a pelvic mass, 14 centimeter left ovarian mass, so another unilateral large tumor, multiloculated smooth outer surface, and this is what we had. All right, so this is what I mean by infiltrating pools of mucin. Uh, this is something that, you know, when you look at it, it looks just so bland you know what is going on here this is so so bland and uh dr esther oliva has written nicely about this uh, uh this is these are tumors that look so deceptively benign they look hypermucinous and you have this almost scalloping border to to the um epithelial uh, stromal interface Again, infiltrating mucin. So again, we can very easily find our, our place on the algorithm here, right? It's definitely epithelial, it's mucinous, and we know we have infiltrating mucin. So 
the pitfall with something like this, if if you are not aware of it, is that people will call this a mucinous um, cystadenoma or a mucinous borderline tumor. Uh, but this, in fact, um, is something that I would strongly raise the possibility of a, of a metastasis. Um, so um, this was an, another one where subsequently in the operative note, we found uh, mucinous, the mucinous material was present on the peritoneum. So this was actually a classical example of uh, pseudomyxoma peritonei. Um, and uh, this by immunohistochemistry also, this had a, a GI immunophenotype. Uh, so this was called an invasive low-grade mucinous neoplasm favor uh, metastasis of appendiceal origin. This is called on permanent sections. Uh, and in fact, um, this patient uh, did, did have this in the end. Uh, so what is our conclusion from this? This was a large unilateral mass. It had a smooth surface. It was very deceptive cytologically, but the key there was that infiltrating mucin and that hypermucinous look. Okay, case six, 57 year old lady with a pelvic mass. This was a large 26 centimeter right ovarian mass, which was unilateral, uh, multiloculated cystic, smooth outer surface and intraoperative findings um, uh, showed no evidence of peritoneal disease. So here's an, another very, very, very bland looking neoplasm. Okay, so we're epithelial, we're, mucin we're mucinous, what do we do? So um, I think you know now that just calling this mucinous cystadenoma, you have to be careful, right? Um, and I think, let's see what we did here. Uh, in On permanence, uh, this ended up being uh, a low-grade mucinous neoplasm, favor metastasis. Again, a large uh, unilateral mass with a smooth surface. And there, although there were no clinical signs of an extra ovarian primary, the case was highly suspicious. And turns out there was tumor in the distal appendix identified at second surgery. And this ended up being a low grade mucinous adenocarcinoma. And here it is in the appendix. Okay, so um, it's important to know that if, if you have one of these ovarian mucinous tumors, um, you have to be careful that it's actually not arising in association with a uh, teratoma in the ovary, because those tumors will have the identical appearance and the immunohistochemical profile of an appendiceal primary. So if you get one of these tumors and you, you're ending up working it on permanent uh, and there is no intraoperative findings of, of anything else abnormal in the peritoneum, you have to closely examine this ovary, take lots of sections to make sure you're not dealing with a teratoma. Okay, case seven. Pre presenting history is a 58-year-old female with a pelvic mass. Again, I think you're getting a hang of a theme here. 15-centimeter uh, mass, unilateral, multiloculated solid and cystic, and a smooth outer surface. Okay, so here is a nice, nice, nice example of what um, I had alluded to before. So we've got lots of lots of glands, but the glands are, they are, they have, they're, they still maintain clear distinctions from each other, right? So they're not merging. And there's quite a bit of epithelial proliferation, intraglandular epithelial proliferation, okay? Here we have, um, we know this tumor is mucinous. We've got some, um, but we have a low grade uh, cytology happening here. Uh, and then in some areas, it starts to get a little bit more complex. And then we come to an area where that nice distinction that each gland had uh, is lost. Now there's no intervening stroma anymore between these glands. So here is more of that tumor. 
So again, we know where we are on the algorithm. We know hands down, this is an epithelial tumor. This is a mucinous tumor. Um, we do not have diffuse high grade cytology. We do not have something that's diffusely infiltrative. We only have a focal area of, of uh, infiltrative growth, or actually more, actually it's not even infiltrative, it's, it's more pushing. Um, and we do not have infiltrating mucin. So what are our options here? So um, is it a mucinous cystinoma? No, because there's too much epithelial proliferation, of course, with piling and detachment. Sure, it is a mucinous borderline tumor, but it's something else as well. Um, so uh, this most likely is a mucinous carcinoma arising in the background of a mucinous borderline tumor. Okay. Right. So, uh, immuno agreed with us. So this was a unilateral lar large mass, uh, and uh, it, so it actually followed the classical rules, unilateral and large. Uh, and it was a carcinoma arising in the background of mucinous borderline tumor, and there was there were foci of intraepithelial carcinoma as well on permanent. Case eight. And this is this is this was a really really challenging case. I'll I'll preface this. So this is a 50 year old female with bilateral pelvic masses. She had a history of colorectal carcinoma treated with surgery and chemotherapy. Uh, her CA125 was definitely elevated, uh, and so were, was her CA199. Uh, so on Gross examination, we received a 13 centimeter ovary. Um, and we were told that there was also a mass in the contralateral ovary, subsequently measured to be 5.5 centimeters. The 13 centimeter ovarian mass was multi loculated solid and cystic and had a smooth outer surface. And this is what we had. So, right away, I think we can say this is epithelial. We can say that um, this is infiltrative, right? It has some mucinous differentiation. And, you know, given all of this history of colorectal carcinoma and the, you know, this does not have diffuse, this, this has a diffuse, um, at least intermediate grade cytology uh, and this necrosis, uh, I thought, well, this is a pretty easy diagnosis of colorectal carcinoma metastatic to the ovary. Now, I happen to be the pathologist that received also the permanent section. And as soon as I saw the permanent section, the first permanent section, I said, uh oh, <laughs> what's going on? So, this is the permanent section. So, again, we see that. Um, uh, necrosis, but the nature of these uh, epithelial glands does not quite look uh, like colorectal carcinoma. It looks a little bit different. In fact, it looks a little bit endometrioid. <laughs> so in addition to this, to make the case uh, further challenging, there were areas of this ovary that looked like this. So entirely different, same over entirely different looking area than what what we saw. So even even if if even if here you are still considering colorectal carcinoma metastasis, just by virtue of having these two tumor types in the same ovary, um, this is very concerning for actually a primary, right? Now, how about the fact that this was a bilateral? These are bilateral masses. Well, this is what we had in the other ovary. We had something that looks like looked like a seromucinous borderline tumor. So this was a, an extremely challenging case that I, I, I still have it in my office and I show it to everybody that rotates with me. Uh, so this was a in the large tumor where we took the frozen section. This was actually a primary ovarian endometrioid carcinoma and clear cell carcinoma. Uh, and the other side was a primary ovarian seromucinous borderline tumor. Interestingly, 
both tumors had intact expression of mismatch repair immunohistochemical markers. This is a very, very unusual case. Um, of course, previous cancer history was a major bias here. But the, the learning point and the pitfall that I would leave you with is, you know, endometrioid carcinoma, particularly if it has an element of a solid component and mucinous differentiation can resemble a colorectal metastasis on frozen section. A patient was sent for genetic counseling. I don't have any further follow-up uh, from this. Okay, so that concludes the mucinous tumor section. Uh, and in the next 15 minutes, we have a few more uh, fun cases to go through. So we have a 58-year-old lady with a 17-centimeter mass. It is unilateral, a smooth outer surface, and CA125 is uh, 46. Okay, so what do we see here? So just on low power, it looks like something that is, um, you know, very uh, composed of simple glands, shall we say. And really, these glands, the gland lining does not seem particularly impressive. So where, where are we here? Um, we're, I think we can say we're in epithelial territory. Uh, and uh, the crux of this case is actually deciding, you know, is this mucinous or non-mucinous? Uh, so it's, it's not something that's infiltrative. And at this point, I would, I would actually kind of pause and struggle a little bit in the algorithm uh, unless you recognize this particular pattern. So the most common pitfall with uh, interpreting this is uh, calling this as a serous, serous uh, uh, cystadenofibroma or a benign neoplasm or something like that. Obviously I have listed here options like clear cell adenofibroma, clear cell carcinoma. And this is simply something that you need to be aware of. Here is another section where we actually see areas that look more epithelial on the, um, on the left-hand side, and then something a little bit more uh, stroma dense. So here's, here are these been very banal looking glands in a fibromatous background. Here are the more epithelial components. And I think now most of us are starting to recognize what this is. So this was in fact called a benign neoplasm on the frozen section, but um, clear cell, the, the actual diagnosis was clear cell carcinoma arising in adenofibromatous background. So for, so for us in gynae pathology, this is something, a well-known pitfall, but if you are not practicing gynae pathologist in your routine uh, sign out, uh, this is, uh, but you are signing out frozen sections, this is an important pitfall to be aware of. Okay, case 10, 19 year old with a 13 centimeter tumor with smooth surface, unilateral. Okay, and she's got, she's got an elevated C125, but her LDH is also quite high. Um, so just by the fact that I've, you know, we're dealing with a, with a very young patient, um, you know, this is a big clue coupled with, uh, with the elevated LDH. Um, we are most likely not in um, epithelial uh, lineage territory. So let's see what this is. So this is this is where this is the power of you know getting that information ahead of time because I don't know about you, but this actually looks very epithelial to me. Um, so um, this is what it looks like. And, you know, here's a bad frozen section, right? Very difficult to decide what this is. So even if it looks epithelioid because you know the patient age and you know her tumor markers, um, you know, you're not going to call this carcinoma, right? So what could you say? Malignant neoplasm? You could say that, right? Malignant epithelial neoplasm? Probably not the best idea, 
right? Malignant spindle cell neoplasm, eh, it doesn't quite look like that, right? Sex cord stromal tumor, possibly, right? Dysgerminoma, I like that option, <laughs> and granulosa cell tumor, possible, but again, the age doesn't quite fit, okay? So on permanent sections, this was a very, very obvious dysgerminoma. Right. So sometimes the frozen section is, is the objective is not to say what it is, but what it is not. Uh, so you, you remember to use it as a as a triaging tool. Uh, the important part here is to not call it a carcinoma so that the patient could uh, hang on to her um, other uh, ovary. So she had a USO, not a BSO. OK, so case 11, 54 year old lady with a 10.5 centimeter tumor with adhesions, unilateral, no markers available. Okay, what is this? And you know, sometimes you get, you can't do very much with, with this. What is this? <sighs> Where do we go in our, our, our algorithm here? Can we, can we say this is malignant? I think this is about as, far as I could go on this, I, I, I honestly can't, you know, I could be maybe descriptive, say, oh, it's a spindle cell neoplasm, but I'm not even sure. I, I would personally just say with malignant neoplasm. Okay, now here's what the permanents look like. And this is a very challenging case. So on permanence, we have an, a, an impression of a biphasic tumor, but, really still not sure what this is. Is this, you know, is this like that fallopian tube uh, carcinosarcoma that we had or, um, you know, what's going on here? So it was called a malignant spin spindle cell neoplasm on, on uh, frozen section. And this ended up being a sertoli latex cell tumor with sarcomatous components. So we had a, a pan keratin here that that uh, highlights um, that highlights the, um, uh, the the sex cord stromal component, and then here is myogenin that highlights the um, rhabdomyoblastic differentiation in the sarcomatous component. Here's our inhibin. Here's our EMA. So challenging case. All right, so we have a 56 year old lady with a 13 centimeter mass, smooth outer surface, unilateral lesion, no markers available. Um, hemorrhagic center with a dense rim was noted on gross examination. Okay, so this is something that, you know, should be simple, but it's not. <laughs> um, so, when we went to this uh, so-called uh, as we said, um, hemorrhagic center, uh, sorry, um, yeah, the hemorrhagic center, this is what we had, not much cellularity, and this is the dense white rim, okay? So where would we go with this? So, this is something that I, I obviously would not call epithelial. I would put in the non-epithelial category. Uh, and then I would give it a general description from there on. This is what the, perf the permanent section looked like. And now we see that this white fibrous rim really looks like a fibroma. So this was a low grade sex cord stromal tumor with extensive degenerative change. That was the diagnosis given on frozen section and basically ended up being called a fibroma with degenerative changes on the permanent. Okay, case 12, we're in a final stretch here. A uh, 64 year old lady with a 4.2 centimeter tumor with a smooth surface. All right, so here's what we've got. So what do we do with this guy? kind of see an uh, area of sort of cording, very difficult to determine where, you know, where we are on this, on the algorithm here. I, I don't think that I could commit to calling this uh, epithelial, 
right? So what are the options? Malignant neoplasm, malignant epithelial neoplasm, malignant spindle cell neoplasm, or malignant sex cord stromal tumor. This is what it looks like on permanence. And this was called granulosa cell tumor on um, frozen section, but this actually ended up being a follicular lymphoma. And this is one of those things that you have to have to be aware of. Um, let's go back. I just want to go back here and show you something. S we don't have tumor markers here, but I have made a mistake in my career once where there was a lymphoma with a very elevated CA125. And it's very important to remember that lymphomas can have an elevated CA125. So while CA125 is very useful sometimes, it can, it can really, really trip you up with a lymphoma. What can we say about this? It's, it's really, it's not making any glands. It's not making any nests. Even though it looks somewhat epithelial and the, the cells are kind of aggregating, it really is not committed to the epithelial lineage. And that's my big message on, on frozen section. You know, um, don't, don't try to be too specific. If, if you have any inkling, if you're uncertain, raise the possibility of lymphoma because you want to get that tissue, that fresh tissue preserved. Okay, so as I said, no nesting, no grooves, cannot call this epithelioid. Okay, so... Um, I hope this was an informative session for you guys. Um, we talked about what to know and what to do before you go into a frozen section when you're dealing with a case. Uh, what are the distinctions that are most important to intraoperative patient management? Um, I've shared with you the algorithm that I find uh, most helpful. Y you, you can certainly take that and develop your own from that. Uh, and I hope that the case examples that we went through were, were illustrative uh, today of, of some of the, the pitfalls uh, and uh, difficult but recurring cases that you may encounter. Um, I love... Winston Churchill <laughs> quotes. So I'll read a few here. Success consists of going from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm. I think in pathology, we, we appreciate that a lot. If you're going through hell, keep going. Uh, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. And it is the courage to continue. Um, that counts. So I encourage you, my friends, to continue with courage. And, and I wish you all the best. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. George Evis, for this very useful lecture. And I'm sure our audience has enjoyed it because it is something so our routine that uh, we face in our day-to-day -day frozen section and uh, ovarian frozen sections are always so challenging. So I have a few questions online mm -hmm. that I can see and I will read them to you. Okay. The first question is, how to differentiate the infiltrating pools of mucin from mucin extravasation in mucinous borderline tumors? Um, so usually when you have mucin extravasation, it, it's a focal event. Uh, it, so a gland may rupture, uh, but when you have pools of mucin, it should be something that you should see throughout your frozen section uh, and maybe on multiple <clears throat> section. So it's it's the kind of foca focal versus diffuse phenomenon. It's a very good question. Just one, another one. Let me, sorry for the lag. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So the next question is, um, have you ever had experience of a primary signet ring cell ovarian carcinoma? Should we think at signet ring cell carcinoma on frozen section when facing with that morphology and there are nothing else suspicious in the abdomen? I think on frozen section, if you see signet ring, uh, this is a metastasis until proven otherwise. Um, have I ever seen a primary 
uh, ovarian carcinoma exhibiting signet ring morphology? Yes, but it was a very focal event. I think if, excuse me, if you're seeing diffuse signet ring um, cells, this is a this is a metastasis until proven otherwise. And, and uh, I, I have I have never seen an ovarian primary myself uh, with diffuse signet rings. Uh, there is one question that uh, is from me. Sorry, uh, the, sorry I'm just going to say on the only proviso to this would be if it's arising in association with a teratoma. I have not seen that, but I could I could see a possibility for a case like that. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that's fine. So I have a question for you. So uh, the case that you uh, described, it is case number eight, which was very challenging that the patient had col colonic primary before, mm -hmm. and then it turned out to be uh, endometrioid and there was clear cell on the other side. So what is your advice on a case like this? Because I mean, on frozen section, how to approach it? Because we have, this can happen anytime that we have a mass in the ovary and the patient has history of colonic carcinoma and then the, it just looks like now, like, you know, I mean, adenocarcinoma with some comedian necrosis. What is your best the advice that how best we should ward it when we see something like this on frozen section? So, I mean, this is, this is one of these very um, unusual cases because I think the combination of this morphology and actually the clear cell carcinoma was in the same ovary as the endometroid. Uh, this is, this is just, it's like, you know, the lottery. Uh, so the fact that the patient had a history of colorectal carcinoma before, that she presents now with bilateral ovarian masses, that the area that we happened to sample on frozen section, it resembled colorectal cancer so much. Uh, these are all, uh, I think, I mean, I, I, so this was my this was my frozen section pitfall, <laughs> and you know I I was thinking about this you know if faced with an, the same situation in the future, you know uh, I would probably call it a metastasis because ninety nine out of a hundred that would be the right answer. Um, I, the reason I want to show this is particularly is more for the purposes of how endometrioid carcinoma can resemble colorectal. Um, so that, that I think is the most powerful takeaway point from this. Uh, so, so you ideally, uh, if, if you have uh, the ability to examine the contralateral ovary, I would say that would have been a very good idea in this case, because if I'd cut into that other ovary and found a serous uh, seromucinous borderline tumor, I may have backed off uh, from the metastasis diagnosis, but I was just so biased by the history. So then in a case like this, so should we say that uh, carcinoma present, patient's history of uh, uh, colonic primary is noted, however, cannot rule out an ovarian primary, period. <sighs> You could always equivocate like this, right? And and you you wouldn't be you wouldn't be wrong, um, but at the same time, ninety nine percent of the time you would call it a metastasis. If you call it a metastasis, you would be correct. So in frozen section, you have to strike the balance of you know never being wrong and being helpful to the clinician, and depending on the kind of environment that you practice in, uh, it, it, that, that I don't know where that needle is. Uh, you know, if you're practicing in a, in, in a litigious environment, if you're practicing in an environment where, you know, you will get huge heat from your surgeons for being wrong, you obviously need to stay more on the conservative side. Uh, in my practice, uh, I think, you know, the, the surgeons understand that, uh, you know, we're trying to go as far as we can safely as much of the time as we can, uh, which means that sometimes we will make a mistake. So, so I'm willing to go farther to be more helpful, but sometimes I make a mistake. Right. Thank so you. We, so there is yeah. a question from one of the viewers. So the question is, 
do we have to comment on frozen section between expansile versus infiltrative pattern in mucinous carcinomas and what's your experience on this so the so the mucinous carcinomas with an infiltrative pattern uh, have a worse prognosis than the ones with an in, uh, expansile pattern uh, there there should be no impact however uh, you know the the with this diagnosis on frozen section. I think if, if you are at a point of calling it carcinoma, that's uh, that should be sufficient for the purposes of the frozen section. So because we are in the mucinous realm, there is, I think there was a case of which we had a few days back. Uh, I mean, I have some vague information, but it is something like this. I think the patient had a big ovarian mass mm -hmm. and there is a pseudomyxoma <laughs> as well. And uh, the surgeons are suspecting maybe it is an appendiceal origin, but there is, uh, but the appendix is hidden and the frozen section is from the ovary. So mm -hmm. in that scenario, how best you diagnose this? Mm. Like, I mean, yeah. do you call it? I, like, I, I would mean, know. No, I would, I would hedge, I would hedge there. And I would say, uh, you know, mucinous neoplasm cannot exclude the possibility of a metastasis. Right. And in the same situation, suppose when you have a frozen section from a from a like you know peritoneal biopsy, and you don't know whether uh, it is from the appendix or from the ovary, how best you approach on frozen section? So you're talking about a, a frozen section of a peritoneal biopsy, right? And you're seeing. Sorry, what? Are you, can you repeat the question? So suppose it's a frozen section of a peritoneal biopsy yes. and you see mucinous like you know lesion low grade mucinous uh, lesion so how best you call it just I mean, do you suggest anything about the origin or just leave it like that okay so if you have i I don't usually receive peritoneal biopsies for for frozen section uh, but if I did uh, just by virtue of the fact that you are finding mucinous epithelium in the peritoneum, I think, uh, you know, in my mind really tips the scales towards metastasis. So I would stay uh, equally equivocal. I would say, you know, uh, low grade mucinous lesion cannot exclude the possibility of metastasis. I think, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that really uh, is much better handled as a uh, permanent section that is processed rush uh, and you have a chance to do some immunohistochemical workup. Thank you. Uh, I can see another question online. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you find a mucinous tumor bilateral mm -hmm. with peritoneal metastasis, but the glands show low grade features. Mm -hmm. Can it suggest most likely to be an ovarian primary? So bilateral mucinous tumors that are primaries are most likely to be um, seromucinous borderline tumors. Um, and they are now in uh, their, their counterpart on the carcinoma side is actually endometrioid carcinoma. So um, so yes, it is it is it is possible, but you if you are talking about not seromucinous borderline, but mucinous borderline and then being bilateral tumors, I would say that's very unusual. That's very unusual. I, I I would uh, weigh the scales in favor of metastasis here uh, strongly. Again, unless, you know, uh, this is very unlikely to that they're associated with teratomas. Right, uh, I see another question. So this is related to one of the case that you shared as uh, uh, finally diagnosed as dysarminoma. Yes. So, I mean, the question is that how will you approach this case on frozen section? Because it might be very hard to call it disarminum on frozen. How mm -hmm. do you call it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
I believe, let's go back to the case itself. Uh, I don't know if I can go. Okay, shouldn't, it should be towards the tail end. It was 10 or so. Yeah. Okay, so here we are. Right, okay. Right. This looks pretty ugly on frozen section. Now. Yes, yes. So if, let me just see what it was called initially so that I can, um, Yeah, so it was called favorite dysgerminoma. It was not, this was not my diagnosis. I think um, this is something that I personally, looking at it like this, I would say that this is a malignant neoplasm and I would leave it at this and then I would have a conversation with the surgeon saying, you know, this is my differential diagnosis. I think there is enough here that that we can, you know, because this is a young patient, right? We we don't what we don't want to call is carcinoma unless we are absolutely sure. And that's the difference between frozen section and permanent section, right? Here, the big the big mistake would be to call this carcinoma and then the patient loses both ovaries. Right. So I think if you cannot make the with in this context, right, young patient, elevated LDH, um, you have this, which you know could could convert into a germ cell tumor. Absolutely, uh, it's more important to be conservative. And if it turns out, you know that this is a carcinoma in the end, they can go back. But you want to stay more on the conservative side. And that would be, you know, that would be a discussion with the surgeon as well. I I would not want this patient to lose. Their, their other ovary on the account of, of this frozen section. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Georgievis. Uh, there are a lot of comments online. So I think these are the questions that I could find. Okay. But there are a lot of comments of appreciation from the viewers that the great cases. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And uh, Thank you. there was someone from Belgrade who said that this was a great talk. So. <laughs> great. Oh, it's so great to, to have everybody around the world. This is wonderful. Yeah. And uh, someone said that great talk and topic selection. So, and uh, yeah, and I think uh, we, you had a lot of viewers who joined from so many different parts of the world. And uh, I think uh, there were viewers from Brazil, viewers from India, Peru. Oh, um, wonderful, that's so wonderful. Will I, will I have a chance to see these comments? I don't, I don't see them here right now. Uh, but uh, you I can see to... them on Facebook if you ah, okay. go to Facebook, so you will be able to see them Great. definitely. And thanks to our viewers for your support. Thank and, you for uh, everyone. If you have more questions to Dr. Yorjevis, so you can send it direct to her, directly to her, or you can send it to us. Uh, we will pass them on to Dr. Yorjevis. And if you like our lectures, please don't forget to follow and like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast. And also you can find all the lectures uh, in our website that is pathologycast.com and you can find all the ZYN pathology lectures as well. So we had we have the ZYN pathology lecture series going on and we have next lecture on PATCAS that is coming up. So that's on March 23rd. So we will have another ZYN PATH session. So that would be delivered by Dr. Lian Huang from University of British Columbia, and the topic is squamous lesions of the vulva. So hope to see you then. And thank you again, Dr. Yorjavis, for this excellent discussion. You're most Thanks welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.